Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Repairing the Harms of the Drug War, a program sponsored by the Global Drug Program at the Open Society Foundation. This is a multilingual space. Interpretation for today's event is available in Spanish and Portuguese. Please click on the globe at the bottom of your screen to select your preferred language. Este es un espacio multilingüe. Interpretación está disponible en español y portugués. Hace clic en el globo en la parte interior de su pantalla para accesar la interpretación. We apologize for the delay. We were experiencing technical difficulties setting up interpretation. Hopefully it's all working correctly now. If it is not, please let us know in the chat if there are any issues. I also want to let people know before we start that today's event is being recorded and will be available for later viewing. My name is Andrea Ritchie. I am honored to be stepping in today to moderate today's conversation um, in place of Imani Mason Jordan, who unfortunately is unavailable due to health concerns. Um, today's conversation brings together human rights defenders from around the globe to talk about how they are organizing and advocating to end and repair the devastating human rights violations wrought by the US-sponsored global war on drugs. These harms range from state-sponsored terror and extrajudicial executions, torture, including sexual violence and extortion by law enforcement agents, long prison sentences and solitary confinement, and mass criminalization, incarceration, and family separation. Over the past half century, millions of people's lives around the world have been destroyed or forever changed by systemic state-sponsored violence targeting Black, Indigenous, low-income, unhoused, and migrant communities in the U.S. and in the nations of the Global South in the context of enforcement of prohibitionist policies explicitly developed to further criminalize and marginalize these communities and countries. Billions of dollars have been poured into drug law enforcement while starving social programs, contributing to conditions that drive both problematic drug use and violence in the drug trade. Reparations is an international framework elaborated to address state-sponsored violence, which requires not only acknowledgement of and compensation for human rights violations, but also cessation, non-repetition, and redress. Reparations are necessary worldwide to bring an end to and repair the vast harms of the drug war, even as, and especially as drug policy shifts away from criminalization. Individuals, communities, and countries who have been targeted and excluded from civil society and global economies through drug law enforcement must be acknowledged, compensated, and offered opportunities for healing, repair, and participation in newly decriminalized drug economies. In the US, groups like the Drug Policy Alliance, who you'll hear from today, along with Marijuana Justice Project in Richmond, Virginia, and Equity and Transformation in Chicago, among many others, are advancing domestic demands for reparations for the drug war. And globally, organizations are seeking reparations from their own government and the US for past and ongoing harms of the international war on drugs. Today, you're gonna to hear from leaders from three such organizations, Queen Adesuya of the Drug Policy Alliance in the US, Kathy Alvarez of Street Law PH in the Philippines, and Natalia Oliveira of the Black Initiative for a New Drug Policy in Brazil. As I mentioned, unfortunately, the brilliant Imani Mason Jordan of Release in the UK and TrackingDrugs.org is unable to join us due to health concerns. I encourage you to go to TrackingDrugs.org for more information. I see a hand raised. I'm not sure if that means you need me to stop before I jump in and start asking panelists questions. I'm gonna assume that the raised hand means it's a mistake and go in. So I'm going to um, ask each of the panelists to kick us off today by introducing yourself uh, briefly and saying you know, who you are, how you came to this work, and to give us a really brief summary of the current uh, manifestations of the drug war in your context. Obviously, I'm sure you could speak for hours <laughs> about uh, past and present uh, manifestations of the drug war, but uh, just give us a brief insight into 
how things look where you are as well as who you are. And I'm gonna start with you, Queen, from the Drug Policy Alliance. Can folks hear me? Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you to everyone involved in planning this critical conversation today, as well as everyone tuning in. My name is Queen Abessi, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a senior national policy manager with the Drug Policy Alliance. Um, I'm based in Washington, D.C. in the United States, and for years now, I've been involved in federal and local efforts to dismantle the U.S. war on drugs and really helping to kind of conceptualize what the scope of ending the drug war actually means and what it looks like. So this year actually marks 51 years since President Nixon uh, officially declared the war on drugs, though we know that drug war policies and sentiments um, were implemented long before Nixon formally declared uh, drugs public enemy number one. Um, the U.S. is largely responsible for engineering and exporting the war on substances that have never really been about health or safety. We often frame the war on drugs as a failure, but frankly, the war on drugs has been very successful. It's been a very successful political tool that's been used to, by the state to surveil, and harass, and oppress people, um, as was mentioned by Andrea. Um, the folks who are really carrying the brunt of the war on drugs impact are Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and health folks, low-income folks. Um, and it really has allowed for policymakers to ignore the root issue of uh, social and economic ills in our society and instead blame drugs and in fact blame individuals who use drugs um, for their circumstances, completely ignoring um, the harms of capitalism, the harms of racism, transphobia, homophobia, all the structures that complicate the livelihoods of the most vulnerable. Um, but when it comes to rolling back these policies, I did want to focus on kind of uh, the state of play in the U.S. in terms of what it looks like and where we are in trying to dismantle this war on drugs. And I think I want to touch on three quick, um, three quick issues. So one, marijuana Actually, reform. Actually, Queen, see... Queen, Queen, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you and just ask yes. you to hold that for the next question so we can get introductions okay. from everyone. Cool. And then we'll talk about sure. the prohibitionist futures that you are working towards. So, um, but we'll okay. just come okay. uh, next to Kathy for just an introduction to let us know um, who you are and a brief summary of the context of drug law enforcement uh, where you are. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Queen. I'm Kathy Alvarez. I'm uh, from the Philippines. So good morning, everyone, and good evening for those who are on my side of the world. It's 9.24 p.m. here. Um, so uh, I'm the executive director of a legal service organization called Street Law PH working for humane drug policies in a country like the Philippines, where next week, uh, Rodrigo Duterte will be ending his presidency uh, after six years, leaving behind a legacy of violence and egregious human rights violations against people who use drugs, their families, and our communities, as well as causing extreme damage to our institutions. Um, in the meantime, uh, while the presidency of Rodrigo Duterte is ending, the law uh, that allowed the war on drugs to happen, the policy that provided legal cover for it, is 20 years old this month, but it remains to be in effect, uh, which means that drug use, possession, including possession of paraphernalia, remains to be criminalized in the Philippines. And so that is the context within which street law is working within. Uh, I just add later as we discuss further this evening. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Kathy. Great to meet you. And we'll come now to Natalia to learn who you are, how you come to this issue, and what the war on drugs is looking like in Brazil. Um, if you're speaking, you are muted. And Natalia, if you're speaking. Hello, good morning, all. Good evening, Kathy. My name is Natalia Oliveira. I live in Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is a big city in Brazil, and Brazil is a huge country, and I'm the co-founder of the Black Initiative to Fight Drugs, and it's an initiative of the civil society for us to build research, political activation, advocacy, 
and with a focus on uh, the drug reform, drug policy reform, and also fighting racism. Brazil, just like many other countries, we know that the war on drugs is targeted at black people here. For this reason, we started to demand change in terms of legislation. And we know that the change must include the fight against racism. Thank you so much. So we're going to come to to how you're uh, building towards that change. Um, and I'm going to um, start back again with you, Queen, to sort of ask you, given the conditions that you laid out um, about how the war on drugs is playing in the US, what is the future that you are organizing toward and, towards and what role does reparations for the drug war play in getting us to that future? And then I'll ask everyone else to answer the same. Thanks, Andrea. Um, so the world that we're dreaming up and the world that we're working towards is a world where people are no longer punished because they use drugs. Um, and we can actually address drug use um, and drug related harms as a public health issue, which is what it is. Um, and really trying to um, analyze the ways that the drug war has infiltrated systems beyond just um, the harms of arrest and incarceration. So the drug war is such a huge apparatus it's really touched on so many aspects of our daily lives in the US, again, beyond arrest and incarceration. So the fact that for decades, people have um, had their families separated, have been deported, have lost their jobs, have been unable to get their job, get a job, um, have been um, facing barriers to education, um, licensing, um, and all of these uh, collateral consequences, which oftentimes are really not that collateral, they were very intentional, um, consequences of the drug war. Um, you know, the idea is that the folks that are most impacted are the most vulnerable already in society. So when we think about reparations and we think about ending the war on drugs, they're both hand in hand because just reforming our policies and ending criminalization is not going to address the decades of harm that people have faced. Um, so I think in the, con the context of reparations, we've seen it the most with marijuana reform. Marijuana reform really has been leading the way in terms of opening up the door for broader drug policy reform. We've seen the US, um, a US state, Oregon, lead on decriminalizing drug possession. And there are several jurisdictions across the country that are now also considering removing criminal penalties for drug possession beyond marijuana. But marijuana justice really opened up the conversation to what it looks actually looks like to repair a harm that we know should not have happened in the first place. Uh, marijuana and other substances should have never been criminalized to the extent that they were. Um, and what would it actually look like to uh, pay it forward to the communities that really bore the brunt of criminalization? So for us in the US context, marijuana reform, um, we've successfully grounded that conversation in a need to address racial equity, both in the context of communities that are most impacted by criminalization, which is separate from the industry itself, but also taking into consideration the industry that's born of this advocacy and what it would look like to make sure that the people who really were devastated by marijuana criminalization have a seat at the table in the legal marketplace. But I think beyond marijuana, beyond commercialization and um, beyond kind of that conversation that marijuana reform is holding, ultimately uh, reparations can start with the public health uh, reputation or the public health consequences that the war on drugs has um, had and ref uh, reforming those things. So thinking about legal regulation, um, what it will look like to actually regulate all substances and actually treat drug use like a public health issue, but also making sure that our communities actually have a fair shot at um, being healthier and being safer. Um, drug policy is very much intertwined with this national and global conversation about rethinking public safety, rethinking what it actually means um, to have public safety and public health in our communities. Um, so that's how we're thinking about reparations and the drug war um, and accounting for the harms that really started from a political place um, and not a place of health. Can I just pick up on that for, because I think that people are, have been thinking about uh, participation in the decriminalized drug economy and regulated drug economy as a huge part of reparations. 
But I'm curious about how you're thinking about the other pieces that you named, family separation, denial of educational and employment and licensing opportunities that come from past drug convictions, immigration consequences, deportation, and then also the piece that I mentioned, which is there's just sort of widespread sexual violence by law enforcement in the context of the war on drugs that under international human rights law is torture. How are you all thinking about reparations for those kinds of um, harms that have, as you said, half a century have devastated black and brown and migrant communities um, in the US um, across time and also obviously incarceration? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I actually think the difficult part that we have with trying to imagine what reparations tangibly can look like for the folks who are impacted by the things that you name is that we can't repair, there's certain things that just can't be repaired. <laughs> um, there's certain things that, um, you know, the state is not going to be capable of um, accounting for those kind of devastating harms. You know, what is reparations for um, decades loss of a family member, a parent from the home. Um, how do you repair the harm of incarcerating parents, separating families, um, deporting people who are no longer able to come back? I think what we need to do and what we are looking to do is evaluating every part of the drug war. Because I think what can happen, and a lot of times is something that uh, white led advocacy tends to do, is remove the criminal penalties associated with the drug war and leave it at that. Um, so part of actually getting toward reparations is naming that the drug war is bigger than just arrest and incarceration um, and acknowledging that and trying to include that in policy advocacy when it comes to ending the drug war. So making sure that these things stop, making sure that people are no longer losing their children because of the drug war, making sure that people are no longer barred from whether it's the legal marijuana industry because of previous convictions or even or any industry frankly because not everyone who's impacted by a marijuana conviction wants to be a dispensary owner but they should be able to have and find viable employment um, that offers them a, liver, a living wage despite their previous convictions uh, so really what we're looking towards is being intentional about both our policy efforts um, and naming that the government has been instituting a war against people um, and this is not just about drugs. Um, but another piece to this is the fact that uh, policing inherently is violent and dangerous. And the war, the war on drugs is just one piece of how violent the police are able to be. It's one tool that they have. Um, but we need to be clear that policing is a larger issue. And when we talk about abolition, I think the war on drugs is a huge part of that. But to get to a point where we no longer need police, um, it's a larger conversation about how we institute safety in our communities. I so appreciate that. And um, hopefully we'll have a chance to come back and talk more about that. But I want to name for folks who aren't as familiar with the reparations framework that there are five elements of reparations. The ones we are most familiar with are apologies and uh, compensation. But there's also, um, as you mentioned, cessation, meaning we need to stop the thing that's causing the harm and the human rights violations, which definitely means the, stopping ending the war on drugs and the policing um, practices across institutions that um, fuel it. And then there is um, repair and redress. And I think that the redress is about putting people back in a, as close as possible to a position they would have been had the violation not happened. And so I think that is what we need to think about. So when saying people who have been deported should be able to come back. Um, families who have been separated should be reunited. Um, people who have lost land or property or educational opportunities should be afforded opportunities to get those back. I think that's the, one of the really revolutionary aspects of the reparations framework is it isn't just about, you know, pretending nothing happened, but doing our best to get people back to where they were. So. Um, Kathy, I'm going to come to you to, to share more about how, as conditions shift in the Philippines, where we've seen just incredible state violence and, and massive extrajudicial executions in the context of drug war enforcement, um, what reparations might um, be sought or bring and how you're working towards uh, different futures as those conditions change. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, we're, we're actually, to be to be honest, 
we're still very far from the idea of seeking reparations because we're still at the point where we just want the drug war to stop. Although I understand it is part of the, you know, the whole reparations process. But I think the immediate need as far as the Philippines is concerned is to really put a stop to the violence. Um, ironically, while uh, just to jump off from what Queen was also talking about, during the Duterte presidency, there were actually uh, four, at least four uh, cannabis uh, decriminalization bills that were uh, filed in Congress and somehow was able to pass at the committee level. And I think uh, within a government like, like Duterte's, that is quite a feat. Uh, and so that gives us a little bit of hope in terms of legislative uh, advocacy. But at the same time, um, we're also trying to engage with the criminal justice system. Uh, we want to provide spaces where institutions from the criminal justice system can see, can understand the impact of, of their involvement in the issue of drugs and for them to realize that they shouldn't be the ones who are addressing, they shouldn't be the ones who are making decisions about the lives of people who use drugs. And so if you ask me what kind of future do we want, uh, the future that we want is where drug policies and programs are designed, are planned, are implemented and evaluated by communities of people who use drugs themselves. But right now, uh, our policies prevent that from happening. And so there's an urgent need to disrupt, to disrupt this the existing policies while also disrupting the prevalent narratives about uh, drugs in the Philippines. Um, there is actually a very large percent of the population who does not want the killings to happen, but somehow still approve of the idea of a war on drugs. And so this is the challenge for us in the Philippines. Like how, do we, how do we disrupt this kind of, of view where they don't want the violence, but the war on drugs is okay? So that's, the, that's one of the things that we at Street Law PH are trying to work on, are trying to find a way to go around. In the meantime, we engage with the criminal justice system. Uh, we've had a series of trainings, for example, involving judges from all over the Philippines, uh, including discussions on the impact of criminalization. And we saw the results of this uh, during a town hall last month, where in public, uh, one of the judges publicly called for the, a, a repeal to the existing drug laws and to call for decriminalization. And to hear a judge in the Philippines say that out loud at a forum where there were police officers in attendance, where there were uh, local anti-drug abuse council officials in attendance, works for us really something else. Uh, it gives us so much hope that we might be able to find more allies within the criminal justice, in the, justice system in the Philippines who could help us work towards changing our existing drug policies as well as disrupting this narrative that continues to prevail in the Philippines right now. Uh, I hope I've made my, uh, my uh, how the things are, how things are going on in the Philippines right now clear. Uh, there's also an opportunity because we have a change in presidency uh, very soon. Um, there was, uh, it's, it's ironic because there's no clear policy pronouncement coming from the new president-elect, but it was a, an interview with the Swedish ambassador that was made public where uh, the president-elect said that he will continue the drug war within the framework of law and human rights. So we still don't know what that will look like, but to hear someone as, uh, with, in a position as high as the presidency, putting drug war and human rights in one sentence, it's also something else. So there are pockets of hope and we will continue to push for these pockets to grow bigger. So. Thank you so much, Kathy. And yes, I mean, cessation is definitely the first and most important element of reparation. So um, definitely that's a, a key part. And I, I appreciate you also lifting up that um, there is a need to really expose the full breadth of human rights violations that come with the drug war so that and that it's not just extrajudicial execution so that people can understand what 
putting those two words in a sentence means that you have to actually eliminate the drug war across the board, not just the most visible, spectacular violences that um, come with it. So um, exciting to hear more about uh, what you'll be doing there. Um, turning to you, Natalia, and if, if folks want to make sure that you uh, receive Natalia's brilliance and wisdom in English, go to the globe at the bottom of your screen and select English. Um, so Natalia, uh, I heard you um, say specifically about the ways in which the drug war is targeting black populations and thinking about how reparations can address that uh, reality in Brazil. So if you could share more with us about the future that you're fighting for there and how reparations might be helpful um, to getting to an end to the drug war in Brazil and to healing and repair, um, we'd love to hear more about that. Perfeito. É, Perfect, bom, Andrea. As all of you know, Brazil uh, had African enslaved Africans that were brought to Brazil in colonial times. In the end of the 19th century, Brazil enacted the Abolition Act that we Black people in Brazil call it fake abolition because it was a process that did not provide people with the possibility of having access to rights. Over 130 years later, it's clear that we Black people how the war on drugs connects with other legislation that were meant to criminalize Black people. And we know that Brazil hasn't overcome the legacy of slavery. We've, we Black people have been suffering in Brazil for over 500 years. We are treated inhumanely. Our war on drugs, the war on drugs in Brazil is intentionally racist. When we observe Brazilian laws, we see legal options that they have, they have criminalized people all along. So it's really important for our organization to talk about the war on drugs and seek measures to curb the impact of war on drugs. Currently in Brazil, most people are not considering the change in terms of prohibition, but we are trying to seek laws at municipal, state and federal levels so that we can mitigate the impact of the war on drugs. Basically, what we're trying to do is to change the paradigm and have policymakers to understand it's an urgent problem. Unfortunately, in Brazil, we're not very hopeful that, that things are going to change anytime soon. What's obvious for us, Black people, Black Brazilians, it's not as obvious uh, for the people who are the politicians. Oftentimes we try to explain the relationship between racism and the war on drugs, and those politicians don't even get it. At the same time, there is a strong movement by the global um, market so that Brazil changes the legislation for can cannabis, for instance. Considering that it's a global movement, we're hopeful so that we can have other discussions connected to legalizing cannabis. The pharmacy industry um, is against legalizing cannabis in Brazil. And oftentimes, the, pharma, the pharmacy industry 
they consider that legalizing cannabis could build the um, bridge for healing mechanisms that are even connected to inequality. Our organization, we tell on the war on drugs. We also talk about the relationship between racism and the war on drugs. And we try to show that this country isn't even aware of the effect of racism. And considering the discussions and the possibilities to legalize cannabis, we are trying to convince policymakers to have the cannabis industry build a model of cannabis exploration to stimulate the reduction of inequality that was caused by the war on drugs. We are wide aware that legalizing the cannabis industry is a small step for us to overcome historical issues, but it could build momentum so that we can actually have public discussion on those issues. At the same time, we want a new industry to be rig to be able to share wealth and offer possibilities for people, especially economic opportunities. So uh, in a shared way, we want that to happen in a way that this industry could provide support for development of the Brazilian people. We no longer want to be commodities um, exports. We no want longer. We no longer want plantations in Brazil to produce very expensive um, artifacts. This year, we're facing presidential elections. We are hoping to overcome a cycle of racist administrations, an administration that has endangered democracy in Brazil, that has removed social protections in Brazil, and we're working hard so that the next political coalition we're building for Brazil is going to unite the country and also consider the importance of fighting racism. If the next political coalition is left-wing, we know that the war on drugs is not a key topic for politi politicians in Brazil. However, we'll keep on working to stimulate increased debate on the war on drugs, we know that democracy is also a victim of the war on drugs, and we must help Brazil rebuild its democracy. We are the kind of organization that says there is no possible democratic pact in the middle of the war on drugs, because the war on drugs affects Brazil at the rural level and at the urban level. We need to put the war on drugs to a halt so that we can actually dream of a new democracy. That's the state of things in Brazil now. Thank you so much, Natalia. There's so much in what you said that I think is so important to pick up as we sort of start closing out by talking about the specific policy um, or campaign or organizing opportunities that folks are pursuing. One is the history that you named about how the law is set up in Brazil and also in the US um, and around the world to criminalize black people, regardless of which laws we're talking about. And so what we're seeing in the US is that when marijuana is decriminalized and actually legalized or regulated by the state, that Black people continue to be criminalized for operating outside of the legal regulatory scheme, right? Because 
whatever the criminalization of black people will happen by any means necessary, whatever law is in place. So yes, if, if marijuana is criminalized, that will be the thing. If it's legalized and as a regulatory scheme, that will be the thing. And so reparations requires us to look at all of that. So I really appreciate you lifting that up and also lifting up the fact that it's not just the government that supports or wages the war on drugs from whom we have to seek reparations. There's also industries that profit from it the pharmaceutical industry and also the treatment industry who are pushing against decriminalization because they will lose profits, right? And so that we need to seek reparations from them, which is comes to this larger question that you're raising about wealth redistribution and shifting economies globally. So I just domestically and globally, so which, uh, and, and shifting away from enforcement, whether it's regulation and also shifting away from capitalism and towards the social programs and economic wealth redistribution that you talked about, um, which is part of the conversation and reparations for sure. And then lastly, that you talked about um, the importance of public discussion, debate and narrative um, shifting, which I think we all three of you have talked about. And all three of you have talked about kind of opportunities that elections and political shifts um, offer to have those kinds of conversations. So I'm curious, um, as you each kind of give some closing thoughts for a couple minutes about specific um, legislative or organizing objectives that you're engaged in, how you're making use of conversations that are happening around elections or political shifts in, in your countries to advance specific agendas. And um, the last a question is in the chat, which I think is also um, interesting is thinking about the role of the US military in the war on drugs. Um, today, the House Armed Services Committee in the US voted to add another $37 billion to an already $813 billion for military. I can't process those numbers, but I know that they mean death and devastation around the world, including in the global drug war. And deprivation and misery in the US in terms of the things that that money could have gone to instead, right? Um, so I, I'm curious, um, and the person who asked the question, thank you, Paula, for the question, was, you know, can um, defunding militarization and policing domestically and globally be something that we can organize around together as part of our efforts to get reparations for the drug war? So two questions two minutes each, you know, what are specific things that you're doing in this moment legislatively, electorally, um, and, and is organizing around US military spending um, and policing spending um, a way that we could be doing this globally. Um, so I'm gonna go in the reverse order and start with you, Natalia, and then Kathy, and then close with you, Queen. I try and do an exercise. I like to show that public budget is something that is built on the money of each and every person. And for this reason, if that budget is public, it should be more transparent and we should have a better view and more say on the spending. People should have the, the safety not to be raped or um, mugged on the street. And when we talk about public security, it goes beyond the governmental money. It connects to the investment to put lightning on the street. We know that public policies in Brazil, they do not cater to the safety of people in Brazil. Brazil kills black people, not only because of the war on drugs. Black people in Brazil have been treated as commodities since day one. And public policy forces, law enforcement in Brazil they receive money, but they don't respect human rights. What we do is we try to show that we invest a lot on the war on drugs, 
and that money could be available to build schools, to improve health, and also provide support for people who are drug users, for instance, and also develop drug education for youth. Thank you so much um, for that vision of how we shift not only money spent on the war on drugs, but just on policing and criminalization instead of investing in safety, safer communities and opportunities for um, everyone and particularly black folks uh, in Brazil and globally. Um, Kathy, tell us as this new president's coming in, if there's specific opportunities that you're taking to shift the conversation and um, also this question about whether organizing around U.S. military spending would be helpful to y'all. Thank you, Andrea. Um, well, we our experience has shown us that it will take decades before laws can be changed in the Philippines. But in the meantime, you know, people are suffering. People are being arrested. Uh, you know, entire families are being separated. There's a lot of sexual abuse, uh, as well as many other examples of torture and human rights violation. And so we have to balance the continuous need to push for uh, legislative reforms while at the same time looking for ways to, you know, for things to change, even through uh, local uh, legislation by engaging with the criminal justice system where we can convince the institutions in the criminal justice system to look, you know, to find ways to prevent incarceration, to prevent uh, violence, uh, to prevent arrest from happening. So these are like the dual tracks that we're trying to pursue, that while we're pushing for legislative and policy reform, we're also looking for spaces where we could find, you know, a practical, immediate uh, solutions to stop the violence and human rights violations, whether it's through community paralegal trainings, to help people understand their rights, uh, to help support communities um, so that they can, you know, they won't be easily intimidated by law enforcement. So we're trying to do all of this uh, at the same time, uh, as if we're such a big group, but we're actually a very small group of lawyers and we're very thankful that there's a very vibrant human rights community in the Philippines that's really trying to pitch in in whatever way they can. As for military and police spending, the I understand the US government does provide uh, military and police funding for our own police forces. And uh, yes, of course, if, if there's a way to channel those funds, for instance, towards creating spaces for harm reduction services, creating spaces for uh, understanding uh, human rights of people who use drugs. I think that would be a better way to spend uh, the money coming from the United States government rather than buying guns and bullets that's just going to be used, you know, to kill people in the dark in the streets in the Philippines. Uh, so yes, please do lobby for us. We would appreciate that. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Kathy. I mean, that is also an opportunity that reparations offers is it really is a offers a global perspective. It's not just we're going to figure it out in one place, but that we actually have to think about harms globally and repair globally. So um, and it also offers opportunities to have those kinds of public conversations, because often reparations means that we have to um, assess what the harm is, which means public conversations, public narratives, public tribunals, public hearings, public opportunities. And I know Drug Policy Alliance has um, been working on having those conversations about the harms of the war on drugs in the US. I know you've also been working on uh, defunding drug law enforcement uh, domestically and investing in the kinds of things Kathy was just describing, as well as um, fighting the money that goes to the war on drugs globally. So in the belly of the beast, um, the source of this um, global drug war. Um, give us some marching orders, uh, Queen, for folks uh, in the US who are seeking uh, a different future for all of us. I think you hit it right on the, the nail on the head because the amount of money that the US has spent annually, I mean, $47 billion between local, state, and federal dollars um, around enforcement, um, again, trying to imagine what could be done, the kind of 
health and safety that we could achieve with that amount of investment for things that we know both save lives, both improve quality of life um, and make for safer communities. Um, so I think legislatively, our biggest opportunity really is starting with cannabis regulations. Um, we've made so much progress with cannabis reform um, and we have a huge opportunity with federal cannabis regulations to one, make sure that uh, policymakers are not leaning towards still relying on punishing, punishing people because we are seeing that actively now um, with Congress in the US um, in terms of operating or regulating people who are outside of the legal marketplace and not replicating kind of a prohibition 2.0 when it comes to cannabis reform um, and making sure that on the front end of cannabis regulation, we can learn lessons that will be helpful for when we are ready to actually regulate all substances and what the reparations and reparative justice opportunities there will be for all substances and people who are impacted beyond just cannabis. Um, but I think another initiative that BPA is really embarking in, in terms of this um, fight to get towards reparations and reparative justice is breaking down the silos, especially around drug policy reform um, within all different movement spaces. Um, advocates across movements have to consider the ways that the drug war impacts their work as well in order for us to make sure that all the folks that we are serving and working for and with um, are not left behind. So disability rights advocates, housing advocates, housing justice advocates, um, food justice advocates, um, understanding how, again, the drug war has infiltrated all systems. So the best way to achieve justice within all the different movement spaces is to make sure that we are working together. So that is part of the organizing um, effort beyond just the legislation and policy work, which you know, can get us free to a certain extent. Um, it's really the work within our movement spaces um, that are going to be important in terms of breaking down stigma um, and the ways that stigma have really, again, worsened all of the impacts related to the drug war, um, accessing uh, people accessing healthcare, people being um, able to really live full lives. Um, so uh, ultimately, we want to see drugs decriminalized. We want to see a legal market or legal regulation of drugs um, so we can mitigate the public health impacts of criminalizing drug use. But again, we want to see the investment that the government has spent over the years in the country and globally um, around enforcing drug policies. Um, we want to see that same investment, that same energy diverted to the things that we know will make our community safer. Um, healthcare, <laughs> food justice, housing. Um, we have what we need financially to make a safer um, society. Um, it's just about time to get folks to divert um, away from, you know, this commitment to punishing people because they use drugs or because they um, have an addiction. Thank you so much to Queen, Natalia, and Kathy for um, sharing all of your wisdom and brilliance today and for condensing it in, into the 45 minutes that we had. Um, thank you to all of the participants for your patience as we sorted out interpretation so that we could hear brilliance um, across the globe. Um, so much appreciation for the organizations and movements you all are part of. Um, the links to find out more about your work are being dropped in the chat. Um, I neglected to mention that I'm with an organization called Interrupting Criminalization that looks, that looks to interrupt criminalization of Black women, girls, queer, and trans people in the U.S. I and mean, obviously the war on drugs is a primary driver of that criminalization. So hope you can uh, learn more about our work as well. And I want to thank uh, the interpretation team for making this a three-language multilingual space. And of course, the Open Society Foundations for hosting this conversation, for all the support um, the OSF has uh, offered to date to organizations who are fighting the war on drugs and uh, working towards re reparations and repair. Um, and thank all of you who are here today for all that you're doing and hope that we've inspired you to do more. Uh, thanks everyone for participation and looking forward to continuing the conversation. It was an honor and pleasure to be with you, Kathy and Natalia and Queen today um, and look forward to sharing space again in the future. Have a great day, everybody.